Robert Norgan has philosophical arguments for God. So uh, welcome, Robert. I'll, I'll do my best to take notes and uh, tell you what I think. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, so the reason for my call is a while back there was a call in that said, why don't you believe in God by faith? And Matt, you argued from a foundational epistemology that faith lacked evidence. So you can't have a belief based on faith. Well, the caller didn't do a very good job of defending himself. So I um, looked up this argument. Uh, a little bit of history. In 1877, W.K. Clifford argued in the ethics of police that it's immoral to believe things for which one lacks evidence. And I think he would agree with that. However, in The Will to Believe, William James published in 1896 a defense of belief without prior evidence. Now, I'm not, that's not my argument. Yeah, let's just skip past the history and get to the actual argument because I got like eight other callers. And while I appreciate the fact that there are people who are going to agree and disagree on either sides, we're not getting any closer to the argument by, by going through the past. Okay, um, my argument then is based on Reformed epistemology. Reformed epistemology was clearly articulated in papers called Faith and Rationality, edited by Alvin Plantica yes. and Wolstoff in, in 1983. So I, I still don't need a history lesson. I'm familiar with Plantica and his modologic ontological argument. Can and reformed epistemology, which I'm already going to object to. Can you just present the argument? Okay. Uh, simply the argument is, it is belief in God is properly basic and therefore doesn't require evidence. And I reject that because I also don't accept that there are things that are properly basic. I think that's a mistake within uh, philosophical ideas, but even to the extent that something could be uh, properly basic, I don't see how belief in a God could be properly basic. And the closest anybody's ever come is to talk about something like the census divinatus, where you have a divine sense, but you can't demonstrate that that's actually real. And so if you're saying that belief in God is properly basic, you are not making an argument. You are not presenting any evidence. You are not even demonstrating anything with sound epistemology. You're just saying it is intrinsically obvious and unnecessary to defend the notion that God necessarily exists, and I reject that wholeheartedly. Well, then you must reject uh, classical foundationalism. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Then... I, I'm a proponent of, of something that Susan Hawk dubbed found herentism, because I think it's not that I reject foundationalism out of hand, Foundationalism has its problems. Coherentism has its problems. We haven't gotten to a full on, uh, here's the one true epistemology, which is why we can still uh, argue and disagree about it. But classical foundationalism, I'm not a proponent of, I'm, but I'm, I, I'm far more in line with, with that than I am with planning as reformed epistemology, because any, any epistemology that comes in and says, Hey, there exists a God and this does not have to be defended is I, well, anything that can be asserted without evidence can be rejected without evidence, uh, to paraphrase Christopher Hitchens. And so I reject his reformed epistemology and this. And so there's, you're not presenting an argument for the existence of God. You're presenting an argument for why you don't have to have an argument for the existence of God. That's true. Um, and I'm not interested in that argument because I don't buy it. And I don't know why anybody would. So what, if, what, if, what if people came to you with other things that they believed in? and said, here's a reason why I don't have to defend this position, and you should accept it too. Well, let's, let's take, for example, somebody come up, comes up and says, white is not black. You don't have to have evidence for that. That's not an epistemology. That is a matter of definition. There's a difference between synthetic beliefs. Sorry, what? That's foundationalism. Well, I think you're. I think you're category. You're, you're making category mistakes. Um, 
because like there's a difference between synthetic and analytic propositions. But what you described isn't so much foundationalism that white isn't black. Uh, that's just a matter of definition that white is this and however, and we could define white and we could define black because those are just words in ways that are different. So instead of worrying about the words, if we're worrying about the concepts, the thing that we're pointing to when you and I say white in English normatively um, has a definition that makes it in simple set theory distinct from black. White is not black because identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle. There's nothing about that that says, here's why I don't have to prove what white is or that white exists. And that's what planning is doing. And the word. Well, we understand the words, and that is a basic, um, a basic belief because we understand. No. No, the fact that white is not black is not a properly basic belief. Not, not. Okay. I, it, it, it's, so, as far as I can tell, as far as I can tell, it's not a properly basic belief, but let's set all that aside because it does not matter whether it's a properly basic belief or not. I don't accept that God is a properly basic belief, even if the properly basic belief has some useful, uh, so, some use. I don't think it does, but I definitely don't accept that a God is one. And to me, this is just oh, a way of avoiding having to show that you have a reasonable belief. Do you have, do you believe there is something that you believe in that's a priori? Sure, but I don't. I, I don't know how any of this is relevant because if your position, as you've already says it, said it is, is that God is a properly basic belief, then we have nothing to discuss because I'm not convinced it's properly basic, and you're not going to convince me it's properly basic. And even if you could convince me it's properly basic, there's a problem with properly basic beliefs. So what difference does it make if I have a priori, a priori beliefs? I have both, as does anybody. And and what my particular beliefs are aren't relevant. If, if the point is to show that we have a sound, a sound reason to believe that a God exists, saying, I don't need to provide a reason why God exists because God is, is obvious and, a, and, a, and a, uh, a properly basic belief, that's not an argument. It's not, an, it's not evidence. It is a way to avoid the argument evidence. Okay, so my final comment is um, from Wittgenstein. Vich, Vich, Wittgenstein. Do you have a Do you have a final comment that comes from your own brain, or are you just going to quote people? Because I'm I'm less interested in quotes than I am in what you think. I you're not going to impress me or anybody else by quoting Wittgenstein or anybody else. Do you have a final thought from you? Yeah, we're in two different religious, we're in re religious language, and you're in not in a religious language. So you don't, you don't, I guess, um, I, I'm, I'm willing to uh, say that epistemic fear is going to agree to disagree. Just where okay. not well, thank you for ending the call with one of the phrases that I despise the most, because when you say let's agree to disagree, I definitely do agree that we disagree, but the phrase let's agree to disagree suggests that there's no pathway to figure out which one of us is right. And that is another attempt to avoid demonstrating that you're actually correct. And that's why my epistemology is going to be superior to yours, because everything that I'm convinced is true, thank you I can, I can. Thank I can. What? What's that, Robert? Thank you. Oh, you don't want to you hear. Want to you don't want to listen to that. Okay. Well, goodbye then, Robert. Um, the thing I, is, everything that I believe is true, I can demonstrate with an with, with with the same level of epistemic justification that would allow Robert to accept it. Robert believes things that aren't believed by other people and has to come up with a new type of epistemology. I'm sorry, right. you had something guess, to say. It was just, yeah, I don't understand why anyone would would use. I, I've never heard of properly basic beliefs. I'm I'm not like a huge philosophy junkie or anything. I've had a few philosophy courses, but I'm not super well read or anything. I just don't understand what the purpose would be because if 
you are a Christian and your goal is to, you know, convert other people towards Christianity and, uh, you know, make your God known to people. Why would you not, like, how could you not try to convince them using evidence? Because, like, if, I, if God isn't obvious to me, then I need you to give me something. And if you're just saying it's obvious and that's it, then I... <laughs> I, I don't know. That's uh, yeah. it. Just feels pretty useless um, as like a. And this is why I, I. This is why I went ahead and just it kind of took over and did that call because. Let's assume for for this for the case and and audience bear with me for one minute and then we'll get on to another call. Let's assume that in fact God is a properly basic belief that it's just obvious and doesn't need any justification. Now, what does that say? about the world that we inhabit. If in fact God exists and it's and belief in him is properly basic, then everybody who's arguing for any sort of evidence for a God is ridiculous. And the, if, if this is properly basic and everybody should just accept this, you know, as, as an a priori properly basic belief, then why is God hiding? What reason could God possibly have to not come down and say, Yep, believing in me is obvious as anything you could imagine. So here I am. Let me talk to you. It it is one of those things that when you have a thinking agent that is not bound by space and time and claim that this is properly basic, when the properties of this being are some that you can't even demonstrate are possible, nothing beneficial to this audience is ever going to come out of it. There are philosophical discussions that are going to be beneficial that Robert could be a part of as soon as he stops quoting everybody that he fancies and actually starts thinking for himself. But. Yeah, that's uh, probably one of the only reasons why I feel like I'm not inspired to read philosophy because every philosophy junkie I know does 